Please stand. We will sing this psalm together in unison. Thank you. 
He is our God. Yet you do not really know him, but I do know him. If I said I do not know him, I would be a liar like you, but I do know him and hold on to his word. Your father Abraham was glad that he would see my day. He saw it and rejoiced. The Jews replied, You aren't even 50 years old, and you have seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, I tell you. Before Abraham was born, I am. Then they picked up stones to throw at him. But Jesus was hidden and left the temple area. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. We join now in our sermon hymn, hymn 111, Sweet the Moments. <clears throat> If I was a betting man, I would say that we as a congregation, we as individual Christians, are facing an unprecedented time of persecution in our country. It hasn't happened yet, but it's, it's coming. And right now, it looks pretty dark if I had to guess what's going to happen in the next 20 years. There's a bill right now before our United States Congress that if passed by both houses of Congress, and certainly if signed into law by our president, would make religious belief, especially our religious beliefs, suspect. We would be forced, forced to say things and do things that go against the clear word of Scripture, against our conscience. We will have rights that we have depended upon for well over a hundred years taken from us. And while that is unprecedented in the life of an American Christian, it is not unprecedented in the life of the church. Most of us have forgotten that our ancestors came to this country, not primarily not for economic reasons, but for religious reasons. We fled to this place because the home country no longer wanted to listen to the pure gospel. So we got on our ships and we came to this country that allowed us to preach and teach, and we have flourished. But we should not be surprised that that moment of flourishing would pass because the history of the church and even the present condition of the church always tells us that. We should not be surprised, for instance, when the United Nations tells us that 80% of all religious persecution is against Christians. Christians to this day are the most persecuted group in the world, period. There have been more Christians that have been martyred in the 20th and 21st century than the previous 19 centuries combined. Nor should we be surprised, brothers and sisters in Christ, 
at any of this because Jesus told us this is the way it was going to be. I want no hand wringing among us. I want no nostalgic looking back, talking about the way things are going to be. Yes, God did give us a moment of blessing, but God has also told us that no servant is above his master. That just as he has borne the cross for us, we will bear the cross for him. In fact, Jesus tells us that the consequence of our faith is enmity with the world. The consequence of believing in Jesus and confessing him as our Savior, as our Lord, is going to bring us into conflict with the world. It is going to divide family against family, father against son, mother against daughter, and so on. And the sooner you accept it, the sooner you will be able to live your life knowing what Christ has promised. That first, the cross, then the crown. But today, today we are not going to focus on our suffering or even Jesus' suffering at the hands of the world. What we want to focus on today is why it is there. Why does the world hate Jesus so much? Why does the world hate those who follow Jesus so much? Today we have to get into the mind of the unbeliever, the mind of the person who rejects what we believe and what Jesus has done. And the biggest reason we learn today in this dialogue between Jesus and his enemies is that it hates Jesus first because he tells the truth. Now Jesus says, who of you can convict me of sin? If I'm telling the truth, why don't you believe me? Now we have to ask, what is truth? And the reason we have to ask that is because we live in an age where truth has been become a very malleable thing. In fact, people don't even use the word truth anymore. They use the word narrative. Oh, that's your narrative. That's your way of looking at it. That's your truth. But brothers and sisters, truth is this. Truth is an idea that corresponds with reality. Let me use an example for you, one that is a hot-button issue today. There are many people today who will tell you that you can be whatever gender you want. It doesn't matter how you're born. It doesn't matter how you look. If you say, I feel like I am a woman or I feel like I am a man, even if that is different from your birth gender, they will say, that's absolutely correct. And they will pat you on the back. They will encourage you. They will push you in that. In fact, the latest cover of Newsweek, we have a very famous actress who now apparently is an actor who has done just that. But friends, does that idea square with reality? Reality says that there are only two genders. If you are a girl, you are born with two X chromosomes. That's what makes you a girl. And if you're born a boy, you're born with one X chromosome and one Y chromosome. There is only two genders. Facts have to square with reality. And the reason why Jesus' enemies hated Jesus so much. And the reason why our enemies are going to hate us so much is because the truth that we speak bursts their bubble, bursts their lie. What we say squares with reality and it is directly confrontational with what they believe. For instance, the people of Jesus' day believed they didn't need a Savior. And why didn't they need a Savior? Why didn't these people who were arguing with Jesus in the temple believe they needed a Savior? Because they had carried out all the laws of Moses, or so they thought. They had carried out all the traditions, or so they had thought, and they said, what do I need Jesus for? Look, I give a tenth of all I own to the temple. Look, I'm always in the temple. Look, I make sure I only eat kosher food. What do I need a Savior for other than to come into this world and to pat me on the back and tell me what I already know? I am not like other men. Think of that thing that that, that Pharisee said in the temple with his face upturned to God. Lord, I thank you that I'm not like other men. There were only two groups of people in his world. There was people like me who had done everything that should make God so lucky to have them. And then there was everybody else. There is no more addicting, false teaching in the world that permeates all of us than this idea that we are good enough, we are smart enough, and God likes us just the way we are. If God liked you just the way you are, then what kind of sick cult are we that we come in here and worship Jesus who dies on a cross? What kind of sick God do we worship if God likes us just the way we are? Look at what he did to his own son 
so that he could love us. And we don't like to hear that. And the reason why Jesus got into so much trouble is because he pulled that philosophy out from under them. All the pride that these people had built up for themselves, Jesus yanks out from under them. And he does so in a very public way. He embarrassed them. And he showed them just how empty their theology was, just how empty their boasting was. Think about this. Just this one example is one of my favorites. People of Jesus today believed that they could have as many divorces as they wanted and still be good Christian people. Well, as long as I did it according to the law of Moses, it must be okay. In fact, they got kind of snide with Jesus. Didn't Moses say it was okay to get a divorce? But this is what Jesus said to them. Moses permitted you divorce because your hearts were hard. But it was not that way from the beginning. I tell you, whoever divorces his wife, except on the grounds of sexual immorality, except on the grounds of breaking the sixth commandment, and marries another woman, is committing adultery. Jesus pulled no punches. The secret of Jesus' powerful preaching is that he placed the action motives of men in the light of absolute truth. And he puts it to them. Who can forgive me of sin? Who of you can say that what I'm saying is not what the scripture says? Who of you can say, even in your heart, that you know I'm not right? You always know, you know always how you know you have somebody on the ropes? When they start attacking you and not what you're saying. When they start throwing insults at you. When they start attacking your person and not your words. You've won the argument. Notice how all these enemies of Jesus attack him. Say you have a demon. Say you're a Samaritan. They, couldn't, they were thinking about everything they could throw at him. But the one thing they couldn't say was, Jesus, you're wrong. The reason why the world hates Jesus is because Jesus knows the truth and he tells you the truth and he doesn't care about how you feel about it. What makes Jesus a great preacher is that he is like a good mailman. A good mailman doesn't care about the letters that he delivers to you. He doesn't care if you're going to like what you open up in the mailbox or not. What his job is, is to make sure no matter what the condition, you hear what it has been delivered to you. Think of the motto of the, of the mailman. Rain, sleet, snow, or hail. I'm going to get you your mail. And that is the motto of Jesus. He doesn't care if you want to hear it or don't want to hear it. You're going to hear it. And why does it have to be so painful? Why does Jesus have to approach us in this way? I've always liked this statement by a Christian writer. Pain is God's megaphone to a deaf world. Why must it be painful? Why can't he rouse us more gently with violins or laughter? Because the dream from which he must waken us is the dream that all is well with the world. Listen to Jesus' words. If anyone holds on to my word, he will certainly not see death. Jesus came to deal with the problem of death. Jesus came to wipe away that narcotic belief that we can deal with death all on ourselves. Or worse yet, death doesn't matter. Truth corresponds with reality. And the reality is that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The reality is that the wages of sin is death. The reality is that even the good things we like to boast about are like filthy rags in the eyes of God. The truth is that no matter how much I wish to believe it, I cannot save myself by being a good dad, by being a good pastor, by being a good mother, by being a good father. I cannot save myself by looking at somebody worse than me and saying, well, I'm better than him. The hymn writer puts it so well, Your death not mine, O Christ, has paid the ransom due. Ten thousand deaths like mine would have been all too few. Jesus bursts all of our self-righteous bubbles, but for this reason. He does it for the same reason that you put somebody into detox. He does it for the same reason that the alcoholic that you love, whose, whose life is being destroyed by the bottle, you rip the bottle away from him. You keep it from him so that he will wake up, so that he will sober up, so that he will withdraw, so that he can finally understand and listen to you and finally have a life worth living. 
When you think about what Jesus says, Jesus' truth is not just to show us that we need him, but his truth is to give us the salvation that God has provided for us. That's what makes Jesus so wonderful. He says to us, anyone who holds to my words will never see death. Think about what Jesus is promising us. He's promising us that whenever we get rid of all of our ideas and hold on to his, we will live eternally. Now people are aghast at that. Look at the people today. They were aghast. They made fun of him for it. They thought he was crazy for saying that. But friends, have you ever noticed this difference of what Jesus says in all the other religions of the world? All the other religions of the world do a good job of not guaranteeing you're going to go anywhere. My favorite is Mohammed. Mohammed on his deathbed was asked by his, his followers, Oh great Mohammed, if we follow your teaching, shall we enter into glory as well? And this is what Mohammed said. Think about this. He said,